but you know her. The doll sensation that has swept the world for 50 years and generated billions of dollars for company Mattel. She's a fashion icon, she's a doctor, one time she was a Marine Corps sergeant. All right, Bobby. And now she is finally starring in her very first movie. Except not really. What if I told you Greta Gerwig's new film Barbie wasn't the first time our favourite doll had hit the screen, but was in fact the 43rd? Yeah, they've actually been 42 straight to VHS slash DVD slash streaming Barbie movies, and I wanted to be caught up on all of them before the new one came out. What if I missed a reference? What if I didn't recognise an outfit? <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. Come on. So I decided to watch every single Barbie movie, from the ones you watched in your childhood all the way to the ones that came out in March of this year. And I'll be honest, I'm a changed man. I am not the same snug boy I was 42 films ago. My brain chemistry has been altered, I only see the colour pink, and I often wake up in the night with an insatiable thirst to dye my hair bleached blonde. So let me tell you about my experience. I'm going to take you through every single film, tell you which ones are good, which ones are bad, and at the end, I will give the definitive, undisputed, definitive ranking of every single Barbie movie. Why should you trust my opinion? All I ever do is talk about video games and sometimes movies and one time I talked about Sailor Moon for like an hour. And I mean, let's be real. Straight white guys in their 20s weren't exactly the prime audience for these movies. So for the sake of integrity, ethics and honesty, which are all things I value very highly on the Snug Boy channel, let's just say I've been signed off by an independent third party who is an expert in all things girls. And now I feel perfectly qualified and certified to tackle the greatest cinematic franchise of all time. Kevin Feige, eat your heart out. Give me a call when Barbie comes out of one of Benedict Candace's bloody portals. So where else to start with than the very first entry, Barbie in the Nutcracker. So in 2001, Mattel embarked on their first cinematic adventure featuring Barbie, and instead of coming up with a brand new story from scratch, which is really hard, they just took a pre-existing story and chucked Barbie into the lead, which I think is a really smart idea, and it works really well. They even do this sort of meta-narrative thing where it opens with Barbie and her younger sister, Kelly, who is just bummed out because she can't get a dance move right or something. And Barbie is like, hey, don't give up, let me tell you a story. And then that story is the movie. Barbie in the Nutcracker. Like, it's Barbie starring in the Nutcracker. So basically, it's on the same narrative level as your Heart of Darknesses or your Frankensteins. Also, the Nutcracker is a ballet, by the way. Just try to keep up, okay? So Barbie stars as young girl Clara, an orphan girl who lives with her brother, grandfather, and a cool, rich aunt who travels the world. And when the aunt comes home, the granddad says, 22 minutes early. Such bad manners. Huh? What? All right. And it's Christmas! I love Christmas! And for her present, Clara is gifted a little nutcracker, which her brother promptly ruins. And that's a great life lesson. If you have a little brother, he will ruin everything. Then something magical happens. When Clara wakes up, she sees her little nutcracker is alive and is fighting an army of rats. And these aren't your New York pizza rat kind of rodents. These guys are here for blood. And then caught in the crossfire, the evil mouse king shrinks Clara down to their miniature size and... Okay, you know when you're a kid and things are really scary for no reason? I have such a visceral memory of peeking around the corner, watching my sister watch this on her VHS tape, getting up to this part and being super scared. Like I had nightmares for weeks. And then you're an adult and you watch them and... God, I was a fucking idiot child. So Clara has to go on an adventure to return to normal, find the sugar plum princess, who we all know is the only one that can actually defeat the Mouse King, and maybe even unlock the mysteries of the Nutcracker. Crack his own nut to speak. Crack his own nut to speak. Now this was pretty early on in computer animation. The first Toy Story, which was a benchmark revolution for 3D animation, came out only six years earlier, but it was a rapidly evolving medium. So in 2001, you had Monsters Incorporated looking like this. Shrek came out looking like this. Over in Japan, Final Fantasy was looking like this. And then Barbie comes out and... Yeah, it doesn't look the best. But I really did expect it to look a lot worse than it did. There's no lazy animation or truly ugly moments. It sort of just reeks of early 2000s animation. But there is sort of a charm to it and the way her dress and hair is animated must have been somewhat tricky to work with for computers from 20 years ago that looked like this. Apparently the film was animated in like four months with only 22 artists and one was dedicated entirely to her hair. So honestly, 
kudos to them. So I can excuse them when I accidentally spot trees that are sort of just floating off the ground. Maybe they're magic trees? But there are funny moments when Barbie will be like, whoa, look at that view. And it's just a 2D painting of some mountains. <laughs> awesome. And then there was a really funny part where they walk into the Sugar Plum Princess's castle and the entire interior is a 2D image, which is just a super late, what? It was a trap? Even I was fooled. They got me. Because yeah, the Mouse King is trying to kidnap Clara through the use of this bricked up back guy because just between you and me, Clara is actually the sugar plum princess. And the Nutcracker is actually the disgraced Prince Eric, which is very funny because everyone in the entire film is saying to his face, bro, Prince Eric fucking sucks, that piece of shit fucking coward. So after a long trek and being chased by a big monster, ah, Barbie, sorry, I mean, Clara turns up and saves the day. She reflects the petrification spell back at the Mouse King, gives the Nutcracker a little kiss, turns him back into Prince Eric, and he looks kind of ugly. And she turns into the sugar plum princess. Hooray! Except if we look at the runtime, there's still 15 minutes left. So what's left? A random ballet sequence. Like the whole movie, Clara just knows how to do ballet and so does the prince for some reason. And I know it's based on a ballet where they would dance the entire time, but this movie only had one other ballet sequence if you don't count the little teaser in the real world with Barbie and Kelly. And now I don't know much about ballet, but like, is this good? Is it? I, I don't know. And then Clara wakes up and none of it was real except Prince Eric comes walking in and then they say that they love each other. But like, aren't you from the magical world? How are you here? Did you leave your kingdom just after you were restored to the throne? And then he has the locket that they shared. What? Okay, I know that true love prevails, but what? There are rules and you are not following them. And then it cuts back to the real world with Barbie and Kelly. And now that Kelly knows the story of Clara and the importance of being brave, now she can do her ballet steps correctly. I don't really know how they link, if I'm gonna be honest. Wouldn't it have made more sense if she had stage fright or something, but uh, whatever. Anyways, they do this little dance and Kelly, a five-year-old, is doing a set of really technical dance moves and like a five-year-old surely could not do that, right? So I sent a deranged message to my ballet friend at like 1 a.m. being like, Hi, can I ask you a really silly, dumb question? Okay, I'm watching Barbie and the Nutcracker. Can a, can a, can a five-year-old do this? Is that possible in ballet? Or is that like too advanced? And I didn't know who else to ask. So what do you think? She said, no, a kid ballerina cannot do this. Truly riveting journalism, I know. But that was the first foray into Barbie's cinematic adventures. Was it great? Meh, it was okay. They definitely do have that magical feeling nailed, but I think the biggest problem is just the pacing. It can just be kind of boring at times, but they weren't made for me. And guess what? It made Mattel a bunch of money. And all it took was this great formula of taking Barbie and making her travel through as a lead of an old story in the fairy tale variety. But what about you and traveling through the internet? Traveling through the internet unprotected is scary. Especially when you got hackers and evil do-gooders looking at all of your data. Your data! That is what I'm happy to say that this video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. Yes, I actually got sponsored somehow. With Atlas VPN, you can safely surf the web free and protect it from people harvesting and selling your data, spying on you, and just being generally rude. Ugh. Maybe apart from watching the Barbie movie, there is nothing harder to do this summer than grabbing Atlas VPN summer deal, which is just $1.83 per month with three months extra. And and with a 30 day money back guarantee. Be quick though, as it's a limited time offer. And like, I know I'm being sponsored for this, but it's actually a pretty good deal, genuinely. For less than $2 a month, you get a VPN which protects your privacy on the internet, has a built-in ad and malware blocker so you can have a smoother time surfing the web. They'll help you save deals at checkouts, including on subscriptions like Netflix and Spotify. You can use them on all your devices. And my favorite feature, it allows you to access shows and content from all around the world. For some reason, everything in Australia is blocked for no reason, which is really detrimental to me. And don't I live a curse enough life upside down already. But just download and install, click connect to a different country and you can watch whatever show you want from anywhere in the world. Wow, I'm in Mexico. Wow, I'm in Japan. So for the best VPN deal on the market, check out Atlas VPN summer deal, which is again only $1.83 per month with three months extra. Extra! I'm a newsy boy, extra, extra! <laughs> so check the link in the description and the pinned comment and thank you so much for sponsoring the video. Now, let's get back to so after making a bucket load of money, Mattel was back the very next year with Barbie as Rapunzel. And before we start, 
I gotta throw on the nostalgia glasses. This is one of the ones that I watched as a kid and it's gonna be a bit hard for me to overlook my nostalgic biases, but Oh my god, Barbie's Rapunzel is so good! It's Rapunzel and it's Barbie and she's beautiful and she gets a magic brush and she can make paintings and there's a beautiful prince and a chase scene and a sword fight in there. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Following the established formula of popping Barbie right into an old fairy tale, this one has her taking on the titular role of Rapunzel, which is a story she starts telling because Kelly doesn't know if she has any good artistic ideas. Kel Dog, my bro. You just gotta create anything that comes from your heart, you fucking idiot. So then Barbie begins telling the story of the artist Rapunzel, and before we get too far into it, wow! What a step up. The money made in Nutcracker was put to good use here. There's actual 3D environments and towns and castles and a waterfall and a talking dragon and a rabbit. Oh! Turn around, purple girl. Why is he British? And here we hit another soon to be staple convention of these early Barbie movies that is maybe the most contentious. Barbie's speaking animal sidekicks. To give her some friends and also to sell some plushies, I guess, they often pair Barbie up with a fun talking animal companion. In this one, there's Penelope, the flying shy young dragon with the raspiest voice you've ever heard? You don't think I got moves? Cause I got moves. And Hobie, a British rabbit. Well it was my snack time. Not all crimes can be forgiven. And it's a good thing that Rapunzel has these friends because I don't know how familiar you are with the tale of Rapunzel, but basically she's locked up in a tower by herself forever. And what's her crime? Being too pretty, I guess? And the woman who locked her up, her evil stepmom is... <sighs> You know how in a kids movie they'll just goof or lighten up a villain to make them less scary? No. This woman is just straight up abusive and horrible and treats Rapunzel like a rodent. Actually, that's not even that fair to say because she has a little pet rodent and she treats him better than her even though he looks like this. Ew! So one day, Rapunzel finds a magical portal that leads her out of her bedroom, out of her castle, into the real world. And it's beautiful. There's a village and a baker and a beautiful waterfall and dying children. Yeah! Rapunzel goes to save the day, but she falls into the hole too. Idiot. Until a cute prince. Ooh. Also really quick, every girl I've ever watched this with is always like, oh my God, this scene is so hot. And I don't know, I just don't get it. Maybe because I'm not attracted to people who look like that, but I am attracted to people who look like that. <laughs> so Rapunzel makes a charming impression upon the prince. Whatever his name is, it doesn't really matter. It never does. But the clock strikes and she has to be back in her rooms. But once she has had a little slither and taste of the outside world, she cannot go back to the world she once called home. Rapunzel is then granted a magical paintbrush, which lets her paint anything into existence, including a doorway out of her room. And I just gotta say, the music that plays during the sequence, exquisite. In fact, the music for a bunch of these films is downright incredible. A lot of the scores are written by a guy called Arnie Roth, who is insanely talented and conducted a bunch of live video game concerts. So gamers, this video is still relevant for you. Anyways, then the movie just sort of plays out. She and the prince rendezvous, they flirt, she gets invited to the ball, gets locked back up in her room forever by her evil stepmother after hitting the sleigh button. Penelope proves herself to be a real dragon and they fly and escape the castle to the ball. But then this is where things get sick. The rival kingdom comes to invade on the night of the ball and there is this intense sword fight between the two kings which has all been orchestrated by the evil stepmother because she stole Rapunzel as a kid and blamed it on the guy so she could one day use up the throne after a civil war that she set up so that she can be the ruler of the land, but then Rapunzel proves herself and then wins a day and then she falls in love and... Wow. <laughs> okay, I know I'm wearing the nostalgia glasses, but this one is genuinely really good. It's got magic and mystery and the relationship is done well for a 70 minute kids movie. It's got action, a British rabbit, a beautiful score by the London Symphony Orchestra. Barbie has a bunch of cute looks and it had an incredible video game that I played a bunch of as a kid. So what can I say for except banger? But can Barbie's luck continue from here? Okay, so first off, this is the first movie that isn't titled Barbie in, but instead Barbie of. And that was the first sign of bad things to come. Once again, Kelly is having a little tantrum. Cool. Everyone at summer camp is sound asleep, but guess who can't? That's right, Kelly. 
There's always one. Anyways, Barbie begins telling the story from the very popular ballet, The Swan Lake. Barbie, as Odette, is balleting all around the house, which already feels like an improvement over the last ballet-focused Barbie film, which had the dancing injected so unnaturally. And again, I know it's the London Symphony Orchestra and the majority of the music they're playing is just Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake, but hot damn, does this music go hard. Anyways, Odette is just chilling when a unicorn comes running through the village. And instead of trying to capture it like everyone else is, she sort of awkwardly follows it and sets it free. Even though it gives her this weird flirty look, Ew. Odette keeps following this unicorn to a magical waterfall where she is transported to the magical world and... This is where the film just sort of stops being good. It's very weird because up until this point, the movie is actually doing a pretty good job. The pacing is great and the animation and visuals take another step up. But then when Odette rocks up to Swan Lake, it just immediately becomes really boring. This place doesn't feel very magical and I'd be so inclined to say it's actually a little bit ugly. The evil guy Hrothbar is a chummy British villain, which I do have to stand, but he turned a bunch of people into animals and then just kind of flies around the place doing nothing, just being a little bit vaguely evil. Then he turns Odette into a swan and she is sad but it just looks really goofy. And he has an annoying daughter voiced by that one chick from Friends. Ah! <laughs> Anytime. And the animal sidekick in this one. Oh my god she's so annoying. Oh if I had the magic crystal I'd nail Rothbart. I think the biggest problem with Swan Lake is that it's just boring. There's just a lot of chilling in the Swan Lake, not doing much. Or it's just cutting to the completely disconnected human world stuff with lots of, hey, do you know where Odette is? Uh, not really. All right. It does sort of pick up when the prince learns about Odette and they fall in love at first sight and... Okay, I know I'm a down bad sipping whore when it comes to gushy blushy romance, but... It's just really cute. They go on a date despite meeting just one time and they have a look in their eyes and... Okay, I know it's probably not a good idea to set to kids that you have to fall in love with a boy you just met. But it's just kind of cute, right? <laughs> anyway, Swan Lake, the ballet keeps happening. Hrothbar turns his daughter into a clone of a debt to trick the prince. They go to the royal ball, which, wait, <laughs> why do they bother learning ballet if they're going to a ball to do a waltz? <laughs> his daughter then says, What day should we get married, big boy? And for that, she deserves the punishment of being turned into a pig. Anyways, true love reflects Rothbard's spell right back at him. There is a really cool looking castle. The two get married at Swan Lake for some reason, which is really ugly. God, what an ugly place to get married. Like at least a church and then it's over. This one kind of sucked. The message of the movie, as Barbie says to Kelly, is that Odette found courage within herself. But really it seems like she only found that courage from liking some boy. And the unicorn was ugly, the visuals were sort of bleh, and I even got slightly sick of the Swan Lake leitmotif towards the end. And my ballet friend from earlier told me to point out that a five-year-old girl should not be on her point. You know that thing where they crush their toes to fit into those shoes so they can stand vertically? So, worst movie ever? Princess and the Pauper is the one Barbie movie I feel like everyone knows. And because of that, maybe there might be some bias. This one is often heralded as one of the goats, but is it really? Are we all just blinded by our childhood perception? No, this one is so fucking good. Nostalgia Glass is straight on because Barbie and the Princess and the Pauper is a cinematic masterpiece and an incredible Barbie movie. And oh my God, this one is such a step up from the others. It is so good. Firstly, they got rid of Kelly. You may pick up the vibe from the occasional video I've done on the topic, but I love a little bit of a musical. <laughs> and unironically, this is a really good one. The music is really good and not lazy in the slightest. Arnie Roth and Megan Cavallari went really hard on these songs, which perfectly fit the vibe of the world and story, and really excellently transition when a character can't express their feelings through words alone. And they start off straight away with Barbie as Princess Annalise, which is such a gorgeous name. And she looks really good in this film. Who was born at the same time as the poor pauper girl, Erica, and they look identical. What a twist. But of course, the princess with everything in the world at her fingertips just wishes to be free from the cruel shackles of royal life. Whilst Erica wants to live a life better than her slave labor job because her parents got into debt. Parents will do that, I guess. And so the two girls just wish they could be free by their own definition. In my dreams, I'll be free. 
stay tuned because you'll never guess what happens next. Ah, uh, okay, maybe you did guess it because Princess Annalise goes on a sneaky adventure to the real world full of boring poor people where she runs into Erica and oh my God, they're identical. Annalise complains about the royal life and how she is to be wed without a choice. And Erica tells her about her desire to be a world renowned singer. And after the two realize that despite their upbringings, they are so similar in more ways than just the way they look. Literally cinema. And this is a banger song. I'm just like you. I think that's true. You're just like me. Yes, I can see. You. I know it's a kid's movie, but they're doing some clever smart things I want to point out. Princess Annalise wears an entirely pink dress with a blue shawl, and then Erica wears a blue dress imbued with lots of pink. And they both take turns singing the verse and chorus by themselves, but then come together in the end to sing the same melody, but in a harmony now, now that they're alive. It's just, it's smart and it's clever and it's not lazy like a kid's movie song should be. And again, it's such a banger. I'm just like you. I'm just like you. You're just like me. You're just like me. Anyways, while well, the girls are having a fun giggle in the street, there's an evil British man in the mines. Preminger, voiced by Martin Short, like, yeah, that Martin Short is the movie's villain and he's straight up just one of the best. Martin Short does not put in a lazy performance. He gives us the most deliciously evil, hammed up British scummy villain of all time. He's deliberately destabilizing the economy of the kingdom, making everyone poor and suffering by single-handedly stealing gold and emptying the royal mines, which like, Holy shit, go off king. And once he's caused his recession, he wants to make the queen arrange a marriage for the daughter to a rich prince, but then kidnap the princess, rescue her, and then get to marry her because he is the hero. And then he gets to become king and literally the least insane British person. So he goes straight ahead and kidnaps Princess Annalise. So her advisor slash friend slash, I don't know, just guy, Julian runs back to Erica and is like, hey, okay, so Annalise has been kidnapped, but can you like impersonate her while I try and find her? And Erica is like, all right. So Annalise is locked up in a cabin while Erica is living the royal life, which isn't that easy as there are a bunch of rules and expectations a princess has. Can Erica read? She was a poor worker from a young age with no education. I I'm serious here, I is this girl literate? But that doesn't matter because she's having a beautiful bubble bath, singing to a dog and flirting with a boy. Ooh. And Preminger is not happy about their flirting because he is confused because he kidnapped the princess. How can she be there? Meanwhile, Annalise gets out of the cabin by being smart and girl boss. And she goes back to the village and is like, hey, um, I'm the princess. Can I get back to the castle? And Erica's boss is like, Annalise, you can't trick me. Stop pretending to be a princess, you sycophantic fool. And luckily, because Annalise is educated and literate, unlike Erica, she knows what that word means and will definitely royally and financially ruin this woman's life when she's returned to her royal power. Back the castle, Preminger is like, she isn't the princess in it, I'm gonna go to Greg's mate. And by showing the absent birthmark that only Annalise has, they expose the reality of the situation. Erica isn't a princess, she's poor the worst crime possible. So she's thrown into a dungeon, but then escapes by singing a guy to sleep. Don't think about it. And then her and Julian go to the mines to try and get the mine going again or something, which I don't know, I thought he stole the jewels, but I guess he just stole it. Anyways, they flood themselves up to the surface somehow and rush back to the castle. But by the way, Premager changed his mind and is just marrying the queen now, but Annalise comes back and proves herself to be the true princess. And then there is a chase, but not for long, because the evil British man is defeated. And the girls end up with their boys and have a cute double wedding and that is really cute. <laughs> Me and who? And who and who? No, I'm serious. If you want to apply to a snug boy double wedding, put a comment down below. And everyone lives happily ever after, including their cats who fucked a lot. Why do they draw so much attention to that? Along with their many, many, many kittens. And also they animate these really cute fake bloopers, which I love so much. Why can't movies do this more? Princess and the Pauper is so good. It's got more meat to it than any of the others and is actually a pretty interesting watch. One film critic even called it the Citizen Kane of children's films, which no. It's better. I think making it a musical was a very smart idea because anytime a moment starts to drag or slow down, they just pop a song in and it really helps punctuate and energize the plot. And I'm really surprised they never turned it into a live production. I mean, these movies were selling a bajillion copies and I don't know, in my head, it makes sense they would have done at least a US tour of a 70 minute stage show. But I guess this is why I'm a YouTuber who can't pay rent and Will Ferrell is the CEO of Mattel. Princess and the Pauper is really good. Yes, I was a bit nostalgic, but it holds up really well. I think it is at its worst when it focuses on the dumb cat C plot. Like I don't care that a cat barks instead of meowing. Like yeah, it's a cute allegory for being yourself despite the expectations of the world, but I don't care. 
And I need to give a big shout out to Kelly Sheridan, who voices Barbie, and in this movie, both Annalise and Erica, which I never realized until writing this video. In general, I think Mattel got insanely lucky with her casting. Kelly has the perfect voice that mixes the blend of sweet and friendly with a feeling of bravery and aspiration. Call me Annalise. Annalise? You have the same name as the princess. <laughs> it's literally the perfect voice for a Barbie in a fairy tale world, and she is fantastic. So overall, that was a really good film. It was magical without any magic. It had beautiful music, perfectly fit the fairy tale vibe, and I can't wait to see where the film goes next. Barbie is about to get really weird. Barbie Fairytopia is the first original film in the Barbie franchise, meaning it's not based on some pre-existing fairy tale. And it is so bizarre. It takes place in the land of Fairytopia, where we find our main character, Barbie as Alina, a fairy who does not have any wings and... Okay, let's address it. This film looks so weird. It's 2005 and I just don't think the technology was quite there yet to imagine this fantastical fairy world. It's kind of giving ugly sonic green hills off. So the story is that Topaz, one of Fairytopia's guardians, has been kidnapped by her evil twin sister, Laverna. Then all the flower houses they live in begin to die. So Alina has to go and rescue Topaz and stop Laverna by going on a big adventure and... Here's my slight problem. Because Alina has no wings, the movie is just a lot of her walking. Just walking everywhere. And it's this big fantastical world that we see from a very low, slow perspective. But don't worry because we're accompanied by her best friend in the entire world, Bibble. We've got to talk about Bibble. In the movie so far, Barbie has had an animal sidekick, but they usually talk English, right? Bibble speaks like Bibbleese or something. He's constantly just squibbling and squeaking and occasionally saying Bibble. He is so annoying, but so endearing and so captivating and instantly attracts your eyes to his attention. And at one point he gets locked up in a prison and at another point he says, uh -oh, and just, what a weird little guy. I don't know if he's cute or ugly or handsome or nothing or everything. He's such an enigma. He immediately takes up all the breathing space of this fairy walking adventure. And upon completion, it's just hard not to think exclusively about Bimble. It's like he was specifically designed in a lab to be the most weirdly mid 2000s iconic weird creature. And I'm gonna be honest, I cannot get Bibble out of my head. Who is he? What is is he? I need answers! So I contacted the writer for the film and asked her some questions. Are you the creator of Bibble? Okay, so I mean, I tell my daughter I am because uh, she thinks that's cool. This is Elise Allen, a writer who wrote a bunch of these Barbie movies, plus has an extensive career in and out of children's media, including working for Disney, doing a trilogy of books with Hilary Duff, and a brand new animated show on Netflix called Princess Power. I wanted to get down to brass tacks and ask her about Bibble and her involvement on these movies. How did you get involved in, in this? I was working on a show called MTV's Undressed. During that, though, a friend of mine who was another writer had been writing for Mattel. She had been doing a couple Barbie movies and she had lots of other work coming in so wasn't able to take on all the movies that they wanted her to do. And she knew I had done some writing for toys because I had also written, I, I wrote the dialogue for several Furby toys. Are you talking about like the actual toys? You like squeeze them and the lion comes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have scripts that are like hundreds of pages long of Excel documents. So my friend knew I had done this and when she had too much Barbie on her plate to handle, she thought I might enjoy it. So I met with the people producing it who have become great friends and we jumped in. Then I asked her more specifically about Bibble himself. I say that I created him and I indeed have an early script where he wasn't named Bibble, he was named Bobble. Bobble. I can't remember and most likely it was a combination of myself, Nancy Bennett, Rob Hodnut, and Tiffany J. Shuttleworth. I think we all had a say in what exactly Bibble was and who he was. I don't think one person can create such a, such a man. No, no, that kind of icon, you need a team. You need a team. In the script, was there actual dialogue written for Bibble that like only you and the voice actor know. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, no, there's there's slug lines for Bibble, for sure. I actually would be curious to know, because in, in a couple of the Barbie movies before your one, they had little animal sidekicks, but they spoke English. Like, was there a conscious decision to make Bibble a little less English speaking? Yes, but I can't remember at what point along the way we decided. I think pretty early on, we thought that would be fun. And lastly, I wanted to ask about what it feels like to be a huge part of films that have been seen by millions and millions of children who are now adults. Does it 
land on you at all that you sort of had a hand in like millions of children's childhoods? I, um, only it, like it's now it's starting to, but I'm constantly reaching out to my friends who d did the movies with me saying, did you know that this is here? Did you like, she walked into a college party, a college party. She walks in, everybody's got their solo cups. They're doing their thing. There's a big television and Fairytopia is playing. Let's repeat. Princess Power is my most recent show. And when I went up to Vancouver to meet the animators, a lot of the animators who are super crazy talented, they're all like early 20s and they're obsessed with Bibble. They have all of this fan art. There's an iron door covered with post-its of Bibble. It's amazing. It's actually, it's very, very gratifying. Only bizarre in that we had no idea it would have this kind of reach when we were making them. We were just movies that we really loved and thought kids might enjoy and had, we were dedicated to what we hoped were really strong, great messages and characters and stories. But yeah, I guess they kind of had an impact, which is amazing. It's what you want to see. And it's weird that they're such icons, but great. I actually had a full 40 minute conversation with Elise on all her Barbie films, as well as her work with Disney and writing her own Netflix show. And if you want to see that full interview, you can watch it right now by signing up to be a member. And you get a fun little behind the scenes video and an exclusive watch along commentary track for Princess and the Pauper. So if you want to support this channel and cool stuff like this, then consider signing up to be a member. What? You can't give me the cash now. You have to like do it through the website. Did you just like follow YouTubers around trying to give them the money? What? So that was Fairytopia. And you know what? After talking to Elise, I'm a fan. And I think I might even try and buy my very own Bibble plushie. <gasps> We are so back with the fairy tale era in the magic of Pegasus. And if this movie has only two things, it is definitely magic and of Pegasus. Not a specific Pegasus though, just like the concept of Pegasuses. It follows Barbie as Princess Annika, who was just about to have a happy birthday, made a little less happy by the fact her parents are rude and a little mean and don't like that she wants to go ice skating with her polar bear friend 24-7. Well, despite their wishes, Annika sneaks out to go ice skating with the peasants. There's a great bit of music with Arnie Roth killing it on the skull yet again, and everything is so good. Until Wenlock shows up. And you know he's a villain because he has this beard and mustache. Come on, man. And even though he's pushing mid 40s and Annika is a teenager, he wants to marry her. And when she refuses, he petrifies the entire village, including her parents. Yikes. Then out of nowhere, Annika is rescued by a magical Pegasus, Brietta, and Okay, we have to address the eyelashes. In pretty much all of these movies, just so kids can know that some of these animals are girl animals as opposed to boy animals, they give them the sleigh treatment, giving them these luscious long eyelashes and full on eye makeup. And on animals, it just looks so goofy. And the worst offender? <laughs> Well, we'll get to her. Anyways, we need to know that this Pegasus is a girl because it's actually Annika's sister. Huh? Who was turned into a horse when she also refused Wenlock's marriage proposal, which begs so many questions. Annika didn't know who Brietta was. So did her parents have Brietta, raise her to 18, lose her to becoming a literal horse girl, and then go, ah, oh, fuck, that didn't work. Let's try again. And then lose her to the exact same thing happening again? Her parents aren't even that old. How young were they when they had Brietta? Why didn't they have any other kids? Surely they could have had a son succeed the throne unless I guess maybe Wenlock is bisexual. Oh God. Anyways, Annika goes on this big adventure with her pal Shiva and this guy Aiden they run into. I'm sure they're not gonna fall in love. It's actually a pretty big adventure. She goes through forests and runs into this troll and makes a great escape. And you know, this movie is sort of like Indiana Jones but for Barbie fans. They have to go get these magical gems and Annika makes a magic wand out of her hair ribbon, somehow. And Aiden actually admits he ran away from his family after spending all of their money on gambling. Isn't this, isn't this a kid's movie? Then they go and confront Wenlock. There is this awful fucking sword fight. God, that's embarrassing. And then this guy just falls off and oh my God, you suck, boo. And then everything is saved in the end and they fall in love and there's actually quite a cute scene where Aiden confronts his father and his father forgives him and he gets to introduce his new girlfriend and it's very cute because it's love and I love love. Even if it's between a gambling addict and a minor. Hmm. Overall, this movie is a lot of fun. Visually, they're still progressing along very nicely. And this one has some impressive views, some really creative transitions, and its music is really lovely. Especially this bit with the heart that sounds a little like Final Fantasy. And 
then there is a super cute fake bloopers bit at the end again, and they have this very funny joke where the big ogre Ollie is actually a British Shakespearean actor just trying to find the humanity in the script. Ollie like lunch is fine. Twelve years of theatre for this. Which, funny enough, predicted the current state of cinema. Awesome. And also this one had a cool video game too. And so now that I brought it up more than once, I just want to say that I'll be live streaming myself playing a bunch of these old Barbie games. So come on and join in on the fun right on this channel. Unless you're watching this video after the stream. In that case, I don't know, watch the VOD. Go away, you're making this awkward. No, it's literally you, stop making it awkward, stop. It's the first sequel in the Barbie franchise. That's right, Alina, Fairytopia, and especially Bibble the Bee Dog himself are back in the continuation of this epic fairy tale for the ages. You thought you knew everything about the world of Fairytopia? <laughs> you thought it was just fairies and puffballs and that Alina was the goat? You think you know everything? I'm going to shatter your world. Mermaids! So basically, Prince Nalu and his goofy ass haircut have been kidnapped by Laverna's evil goons because she is still cursed from the first movie and she wants the immunity berry, which is a berry that makes whoever eats it immune to all magic, past, present, and future. Thanks, Barbie Movies Wiki. And if Nalu refuses to give up its location, then Fungus Maximus is going to commit eco terrorism. Awesome. This whips Alina into action to go and save him, but she can't do it alone. I know she has Bibble, but even that isn't enough if you can bloody believe it. She has to team up with the hot-headed, rude, and polar opposite mermaid, Nori. Don't let her blue hair demeanor fool you. This girl is mean, but not even in a funny way, just like a she is kind of mean mean. Well, then why did she help Alina snug? Huh? Huh? Because she is in love with Nalu. So they go on a big adventure. There's this weird looking boat. Alina has to turn into a mermaid at one point. Nori is mean and ditches her. Barbie has its first ever buff guy, which is such a step forward for our society. And oh uh, yeah, there are a whole lot of bibble moments. Break it down, B-Man. <laughs> And there's this bit where Bibble eats a berry and it changes his voice and one of them is this low sexy voice and the girls go Well hello Berry, don't you look lovely today? How long will this last? Nowhere near long enough. Please don't tell me you're turned on by Bibble right now, that would be so weird. <laughs> that would be so weird, right? <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> and just like how I am crying right now, so does Alina. She's trapped in a mermaid form, which means she would have to say goodbye to everyone she knows, including her best friend Bibble. No! But it's all good because Alina finds a true self berry. And after a moment of worrying what her true self is, she takes the risk, jumps the shark, and turns back into a fairy again. Nora reveals she is in love with Naru, Alina returns to Fairytopia, Laverna turns into a frog, and all is good. How do I remember it's P? Fuck you, you've already thrown rubbish at me before, you can't do it again! The Barbie Diaries is weird and different and a lot of people seem to hate it. What has so far been a franchise full of fairy tales and magic, cute little sidekicks and mediocre looking love interests has now done a complete 180 and become a mid-2000s American high school drama. And I love it. Then before you start booing me, give the film a chance. Is it like the others? No. But as Barbie herself says, you think you know me, but I'm changing all the time. So you can't argue with the main girl herself. Instead of a whimsical land of heightened imagination, we find ourselves in modern day California. Okay, 2006 California. Barbie, playing herself for the first time, is accompanied by her friends Courtney, Tia, and Kevin. They go to a regular high school, there's flip phones and funny scene transitions and a rock and roll band, and it's incredibly cheesy in the best way possible. I think a big reason why I love this film so much was it just reminded me of all the cheesy mid-2000s Disney Channel high school movies and shows I watched with my sister growing up. And sorry to the 51% of my audience that is American, I hope this makes sense. But the US high school kind of seems like this imaginary fictitious place full of gossip and drama and it's so cemented in my head as something that only exists in movies. If I ever walked into a real high school in America, I think I'd have a heart attack. And I guess what I'm trying to 
say is, I watched this movie on the edge of my seat, noting down every bit of gossip and gasping at every social hierarchy power play backstab, every bit of unloyal friendship turned into an act of repentance. I just love this stuff and it's just so juicy. <laughs> so. If you'll indulge me, Barbie is starting her new school year as a sophomore. For non-Americans, that's like year 10. And on the first day of school, after her big summer break with her friends, where Kevin claims he made 26 movies in the entire summer break, that's, fuck you, Kevin. Barbie aspires to be the anchor woman of the school news channel, but uh-oh, Raquel, this uppity buppity bitch is always one-upping and beating Barbie in everything. Barbie comes second place and has to be her personal assistant, AKA slave. Barbie, is a girl failure. But then Kevin shows Barbie some footage he captured of Raquel breaking up with Todd, who Barbie has a mega ultra crush on. So you know it is time for Barbie to swoop right in. She goes up to him, they hit it off, they begin hanging out. Someone is like, oh, he drove her home again, which is that a big deal in America? Because we can't legally drive here until we're like 27. And then they hold hands and they are flirting, which is literally so crazy because my girlfriend said I wasn't allowed to hold her hand for the first three years. <laughs> 15 minutes, Barbie, just rushing things a little. And then you can see, be it in tone of voice or mid-2000s animation, that our boy Kevin is a bit jealous. More on that later. Anyways, the girlies are going shopping because Todd asks Barbie to the fall formal, which isn't prom or a Spider-Man homecoming, but a secret third thing. And literally while she has the hot dress she's gonna wear in her hand, Todd calls and breaks up with Barbie. And yeah, it gets worse. Todd is back with Raquel. I am going to end Raquel. It's like 10 minutes into the movie and yet the juice meter is off the charts. We have never had this much gossip in a Barbie film and I am so hooked. And it only gets better better and better because then the girl working at the store is like, hey sister, I've been there. Have this free diary on the house. And basically what she is giving Barbie is the Barbie diary for her to write her feelings into, which is so sweet and so needed. But something strange happens. Whatever she writes into the diary will actually come true. First it's getting notes left in her locker, then it's her band getting a gig at the school fall formal. Everything she writes into this diary just magically happens. Hey man. Uh, hey man. Can you leave? I'm in the middle of something, man. Oh yeah, fuck. Sorry, bye. Magical diaries are not enough for Barbie, however, as she wants to prove to the media teacher that she can be the anchor woman. So she decides to do a hit journalistic report on popular people, what makes them popular and how you can be it. Now in my high school, the popular kids were just massive cuts. But let's see if Barbie can dig into some nuanced truth and prove me and my biases wrong. So Barbie goes undercover, blending in with the popular kids, sitting on the cool kid lawn and even hanging out with them outside of school, all while receiving these mysterious love letters and all while starting to ignore her friends, Tia and Courtney. Band practice? Ignore. Tia's class president election? Skipped. In her pursuit for good journalism, Barbie is blinded by the environment she is trying to assimilate into. And those love letter notes she keeps getting in her locker? She thinks they are from Todd when they are so clearly from Kevin. Dear diary, Todd. Barbie, I am begging you, stop folding. Being popular must make you stupid because Tia and Courtney are right in on the fact that it's Kevin and he's like, hey, listen, I'm not telling her I like her until I'm ready to tell her I like her, okay? At some point, Barbie realizes her magic journal is magic and she rushes back to the store to talk to the girl who gave it to her, but that girl apparently doesn't work at the store. And the girl she's talking to now is supposedly the only girl who works at that store, which makes no sense. You run an entire clothing chain by yourself 8.30 to 6.30 without breaks every day? Why are you in such disdain to bring on a second employee? The financial crisis is two years away, you can spend some cash. And then the two popular girls Barbie befriended found out she was only doing it to make her peace on them, so now she doesn't have any friends. Also, I forgot to mention the way she befriended them in the first place was by making this fake highlighter pen that was actually lip gloss, which I don't really understand. Like, why can't you just do your makeup before school? Huh? Anyways, those two girls told Raquel, the girl from hell. So Barbie does the right thing. She goes to do her broadcast and announces that no, being popular just means you are a massive c <laughs> And then she decides to do the lovely thing. Instead of airing her report on the popular girls, she airs all of Kevin's 26 movies he made over the summer, which is so sweet, but I know how YouTube works. The watch time jump off is gonna be shit on that. Then they all go to the full formal together. They play a song, Barbie learns to be true to herself, confronts Todd about his notes and realizes that the one doing them all along and the one she loved the entire time 
was right under her nose. And then they get together, the end. Wow. Okay, I don't know what it is, but this one is really good. It's the perfect amount of 2000s cheese with a pace that moves a million miles an hour, making the entire thing feel like a super kinetic episode of iCarly. It's got some genuinely cool visual scene transitions. Every scene feels like someone declares something dramatic and then walks off. It's got flip phones and 2000s fashion, and its plot is entirely built upon high school drama and gossip, and I loved it. Is it perfect? No. It doesn't look good at all with this weird Bratz inspired art direction for the character models, and Kelly Sheridan, who I think is genuinely incredible in 99% of these movies. I don't know if her voice sounds exactly right coming out of this teenaged high school Barbie. We'll come back to that later. But in conclusion, this movie is great, and it feels like what it would be like to be one of the girlies in 2006 California. An experience I will never, ever get to have. But at least Australian schools taught us how to do the nut bush. Nut Barbie and the Twelve Dancing Princesses opens to banger opening visuals. It has the Czech Philharmonic doing some incredible music. The background art and the design of the castle is fantastic. The new improvements to the lighting look incredible. And Barbie herself looks so gorgeous. And then the film is just... Okay. Barbie plays Genevieve, one of 12 princesses under their widowed father, King Randolph. It's a bit of a hassle for him to parent 12 girls all on his own, which maybe you should have thought about before having 12 children. Why 12? That is such an exuberant amount of kids. Prince Albert and Queen Victoria only managed nine, but you popped out 12? Were you envious of George III? Or perhaps you were desperate for a son, so you just kept on fucking and fucking until one of these dancing children was a boy. 12 is such an insane amount, I just can't get over it. They live in a castle but all share one room. That's one room that needs 12 beds, that's 12 sets of clothes, 12 sets of dancing princess shoes, 12 times the amount of food and amenities, more so and to serve the greater amount of people in the castle. Am I insane or is 12 stupid? Anyways, King Randolph falls ill probably from post-coital exhaustion. And the 12 dancing princesses are left under the care of the Duchess Rowena, a mistrunchful like evil, who is going to educate them into proper ladies. Maybe you can chuck in a lesson on contraception in there. The 12 dancing princesses hate not being able to dance 12 times a normal amount or something and find a magical secret realm where they can do that in peace. But Rowena is like, where are you guys going at night? And they're like, oh, nowhere. But they lie and then Rowena tries to stop them and they get trapped in that magical realm, but then they get out with the magic of dancing. And then Barbie falls in love with this guy that can go ham on the recorder. The king is revived and Derek and Genevieve get married and it's over. I don't know. I heard so much hype around this one and people seem to love it, but it was kind of dull and boring. And I mean, okay, I'll be the bad guy. 12 dancing princesses is too many dancing princesses. I think eight at maximum, preferably five or six. None of them stand apart from each other. You've got these triplets, which are just clones. And what are little kids watching gonna do? Are they gonna pretend to be all 12 dancing princesses with their 11 friends? Can they even name all the fucking <laughs> prince? Yeah? Can I see you in my office for a second? No, is everything okay? No, come with me. I need you to understand that releasing a negative opinion on, on a film so beloved by certain audiences is going to have catastrophic effect on, on this brand and its stakeholders and I, I don't really understand. It, it's my channel and it's my opinion and I just- Do you think that this is just all, all fun and games? Do you? Do you? No, no, no. Snugboy Enterprises is is a well-oiled machine that, that, that feeds and, and houses huh? so many people. Did you think that what you say simply has no consequence Literally, whatsoever. what are you talking about? The board of directors just doesn't want you to say anything that could hurt All you. I said is that 12 Dancing Princesses isn't that good. Do you think that you are not replaceable? Excuse me? Do you, do you think that just because you're the face of all of this that, that you're not expendable? Yeah, yeah. Are you kidding me? You can't replace me with him as a clone. Do you think people will notice that you're just replacing me with a clone? Like I'm the heart and soul of this channel. You just think people are gonna notice when suddenly things are a bit different. He's got slightly different opinions. He, he likes Skyward Sword more than Twilight Princess. You think that's, that's so unethical. It is so unfair. 12 Dancing Princesses is my favorite movie of all time. So what, you're gonna replace me 12 times then? <laughs> And 
And that is why I think 12 Dancing Princesses is maybe one of the best films ever made. A solid 12 out of 10 from me. <laughs> We're back with our main boy Bibble and his best friend Alina in the first trilogy set in the Fairytopia world. After saving the fairy world and the mermaid world and then getting the blue haired friend a boyfriend, what more is there for Alina to do? She is going to go to school, she is going to get her VC education, she's going to tape, she's going to uni, she's doing a master's, she's doing a PhD and then she's getting a hex debt of six million dollars. AKA she's going to become Azura's new apprentice. Now who is Azura? She is one of the seven guardians of the world and if you put a gun to my head and ask me if she was in the previous two Fairytopia films, I'd say pull the trigger. So Alina rocks up at the new school and everyone hates her, everyone, except for this one girl who has her own little puffball, Dizzle. Bibble has a girlfriend. Oh. The film is a lot of Alina not being naturally good at stuff, but proving herself in other ways and slowly gaining the trust of the other fairies, which feels a little bullshit because Alina has saved the world twice? T twice now? Yet she starts to prove to everyone that she is the goat. Also, they have to reactivate this magical thing once a year and if they don't, all the fairytopia dies or something? All right. I don't know if this one was for me. I still don't quite think the technology was there to imagine this world, but it does look way better than the first film. I think the thing that just tickled my curiosity the most was the fact that this was the first trilogy. What was so different internally about these films that warranted multiple sequels? Was it just fairy and mermaid toys selling a buttload? So I went back to release for a few more answers. Did they just come to you and be like, okay, we got, we got X amount of mermaid dolls we want to sell in the next fiscal year, make a mermaid movie? Or like, how was the, was the process with that? Pretty much was really hand in hand. It was the creative team and the toy team, the toy line saying, you know, we're gonna, yeah. I mean, I think as I recall, that's a long time ago, you know, it's Mattel. There are toys involved. What I love about working with them is it's never about the toys. It's yeah, we're gonna, we know we're gonna have a toy line that goes with this movie. How can we make the toys get into the movie in a really organic way where it makes sense? How can we make a movie that has these things where it doesn't feel like they're shoehorned in because the last thing we wanna do is make a giant commercial. And then, you know, some of those, these movies like have sequels. I'm guessing that's also like, you know, if the mermaid line just sold crazy well, it's like, oh, we'll just, let's just make more of these, right? How can we branch off of the mermaid line and do something really different with it? We, they were like, everybody was very excited with the idea of, all right, so Alina's a fairy but what if she meets a mermaid? So there you go, money. But that's okay because it's a fun imaginative world. It's very unique compared to the other movies and it's got Bibble, even if he's no longer single. <sighs> Okay, sorry, I don't want to be dramatic, but Barbie as the Island Princess is the best film ever made. This film is so goaded. It's like everything they've done in these films has come together in perfect harmony and unison has created the best Barbie movie ever. And these are not nostalgia glasses. I'm the snug boy, Chloe, remember? I saw this for the first time and fell in love. But Barbie as the Island Princess is a musical, which has been a surprisingly rare occurrence in the series so far, especially considering how popular and beloved Princess and the Pauper was. But this time around, I think Arnie Roth and the writers did a better job at incorporating the musical nature into the film. The music is incredible, has light motifs that carry throughout the story, they hit all the right emotional beats, and like Princess and the Pauper, stop the film from having some of its dull low moments. But you know what is the element that ties this all together into a neat little bow? It's the story. Barbie's The Island Princess opens up with a couple of animals on an island finding a young shipwrecked girl. The only thing with her is this chest with a half visible word, Row. So the animals adopt the girl, call her Row, and they live their life together. 10 years later and they're all singing their little song about how much they love being on this island together. Ro is a beautiful young adventurous woman, Azul is a fun flamboyant peacock, Sagi is a cool red panda, Teek is, oh, oh my god! I forgot about the eyelashes and now they haunt me. Ro is having a good old time being the island princess, star of Barbie as the island princess. Except she is curious. Why does she know this one particular song in her mind? And why do her memories start with the shore? Where does she come from? Ding dong, it's Prince Antonio. And he's out exploring the South Seas as all princes do, apparently. And he stumbles upon Rose Island. After a brief confrontation with some crocodiles, which Rose saves him from by talking them out of it. By the way, she can talk to animals, but like, don't worry about it. Antonio persuades Rose to come back with him to his kingdom where she can begin to discover the truth. There is this very cute and beautiful I want song shared between the two, with Rose wanting to know answers about her life, but also dealing with gushy, crushy, romantic feelings for the first time. And Antonio is pathetically 
fell in love with her instantly, leading him to sing in his head while awkwardly making this gesture. <laughs> How do I look tonight? Cool dude. Antonio brings Ro to his parents in the big castle and surprisingly they are like, no, you cannot marry a random girl that you found on an island. And so they introduce him to the bride of the arranged marriage they've arranged, Princess Luciana. Now, why does Luciana want to be married to Antonio? She doesn't. It's a two-way unreciprocated love forced into a communion via arranged marriage. That sucks. Queen Ariana, <laughs> not that queen. She wants to marry into the family, kill them, take the riches and just keep girl bossing it up. And because she delivers her evil plan via a funny musical number, I say she deserves to get it. So you've got this great love triangle where Ro feels she isn't worthy for Antonio because she's a peasant unmannered island girl who stinks of flies and can talk to monkeys. Antonio wants Ro but has to marry Luciana. And Luciana wants Ro and Antonio together because she knows true love when she sees it but is also forced into her marriage. Anyways, there's a royal ball and the monkey and the panda argue over what Ro should wear, leading her to wear this peacock dress. This feels culturally insensitive somehow. She goes to the ball and dances with Antonio and there are sparks flying. So much so that Antonio proposes and Ro says, no, girl, what are you doing? Antonio storms up to his father and is like, bro, this is bullshit. This is awful, fuck this. And then quits being the prince because he wants to be with Ro and doesn't care about the royal family. Life imitates art. Antonio tries to be romantic and leaves a note for Ro saying they'll run away together, but uh-oh, Tika, the elephant bitch? She doesn't want to lose her bestie and hides a note. And then meanwhile, Ariana is sending her rats, which she can control for some reason, to spread poison throughout the kingdom to kill everyone. And then Ro is being sent off back to her island while Antonio is trying to make a deal with his dad, the king, that Ro can stay with humanity if he rejoins the royal family and marries Luciana. And so of course he agrees, because he'll never see Ro again, which is going to happen anyway, because she gets knocked off overboard by a sailor who gets bribed by Queen Ariana. And then while she's about to drown, Ro remembers that she almost drowned once before in the shipwreck and all her memory from before the island come back and her name is actually short for Rosella, like the Australian bird. And so she rushes back to the kingdom with the help of some dolphins. And then she has to make an antidote for the poison that has been killing the animals and was used on the wedding cake because also today is the wedding between Antonio and Luciana. Which Tika the elephant stops. Let's go Tika. <sighs> then Ro proves in front of the king and queen that Ariana was trying to poison everyone usurp the throne, but no one believes her. Until Luciana, with the goodness of all of her heart, comes forward and reveals the truth, that her mother is evil. And all is good and well until one woman comes forward. She says she lost her daughter at sea many years ago. And if you recall, Ro was lost at sea many years ago. There is simply no way. There is simply no way. There is a way. Ro, or I guess Rosella, is reunited with her mother. She is still friends with all of her animals. She is married to the love of her life and they all go sailing on new adventures. <sighs> wow. I cannot overstate enough how good this one is. It really feels like all the elements come together in the perfect fusion. The visuals are getting pretty good. Barbie is super cute. The characters look great. It has a male love interest who is good for once. The music is incredible. It's got an interesting story with a good A plot, B plot and C plot. Basically what I'm saying is that this may be one of the best films ever made and I'm not joking. We are back in the land of Fairytopia for a fourth movie featuring Elena and Bibble. Kind of. For the fourth film in this sub-series, we sort of bring back the idea of Barbie telling a story. But this time it's Barbie as Alina telling the story of Mariposa. And she's telling Bimble this because he's going to hang out with his girlfriend's girlfriends for the first time and brother, I've been there. It's hard. So although Alina is the narrator, this story primarily revolves around the butterfly fairy Mariposa, who is not played or voiced by Barbie. It's a whole different character, but similar in the ways of confidence and her eager for knowledge, blah, blah, blah. I think this film does a way better job at establishing a brand new world than the Fairytopia ones did. The city of Mariposa feels really lived in with different fairies having jobs and even an organic reason for them not being able to leave. That being these ugly bugs that come out at night trying to kill them, ugh. One really cool thing about the world of Mariposa is that a lot of the fairies have Mexican accents and oh my god they sound really good. I love this accent so much and you don't see it in cinema that often and I know it just reminds me a lot of Star Wars Andor and I really like that show a lot. Thanks. Okay bye. But speaking of, Mariposa runs into the prince at the party and they both realize that they're big nerds who love to read. And also at the party Mariposa runs into this fairy Henna and... Okay maybe I'm reading into things but it feels 
feels very gay. There's some sort of romantic tension there that is definitely not present between her and Carlos. And it doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong anyways because she poisoned the queen. What the fuck, bro? You gave us a cute little wink. So the film follows Mary Poser, who is brave and can use her knowledge of star constellations to guide herself to the Elios antidote so she can save the queen, prove Prince Carlos is innocent and didn't murder his mother, and make everything right again. I think Mary Poser is a really fun ride, actually. I think I might have enjoyed the B plot between Mary Poser's bestie and Prince Carlos better than the main plot. And the best part of this film is that Bibble occasionally interrupts the story to be like, um, actually, according to Barbie Mary Poster, you can't swim underwater without the magical seaweed. And Alina's is like, bro, just shut the fuck up. Just enjoy the story. Bibble, shut up. Anyways, Mary Poster comes back, wins the day, doesn't get with the prince. Interesting. And all is good. Shahrazani does a great performance as Mary Poster. The world building is genuinely a step up. The visuals are getting better, sort of, and it's gone Bibble. So overall, it's a good time. I guess feeling inspired by the storytelling format, we're back with the original film's concept of Barbie telling a story to calm down whiny wah 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 Kelly. Barbie and her friend Teresa tell Kelly the tale of the Diamond Castle and basically... Okay, I'm gonna get in trouble again because this one is a classic, but I don't think it's that good. It follows Liana and Alexa, two besties who are also singers, who are given a mirror by an old lady. This isn't a normal mirror. In fact, it's a mirror they can FaceTime with this one girl for a long time. Melody was once one of the muses in the Diamond Castle, but she was trapped by another of the muses and her name is Lydia, and she is chasing Liana and Alexa across the country, and they have to get to the Diamond Castle first, and also there are some boys who try and flirt with them by playing Wonderwall. And I'll be honest, I just found this one a little boring, and I don't think it lives up to the hype. Um, okay, so basically Diamond Castle is one of the best films ever made. <laughs> it should also be noted that this is the last film written by Alana Lesser and Cliff Ruby, who had written a bunch of the classics. So in a way, it does feel like the end of an era. What? What's going on? Did you hear that? It's Christmas! Ho ho ho! Psst, it's me! Snug boy, I'm not actually Santa. And you know who else loves Christmas? Your girl, Barbie. And oh my God, Barbie in A Christmas Carol may be the best Christmas movie ever made. A bold take, I know, but I'll win you over. It opens with Barbie and Kelly getting ready to go to a Christmas charity, but Kelly is being a whiny little you know what. But actually, this is the last time we'll ever see Kelly again, because in America, she was known as Kelly, but in other countries, she was known as Shelly. So in 2011, Mattel changed her name to Chelsea Worldwide to unify her globally. So, great. Anyways, Barbie says, her down and shows her a snow globe and begins to tell her a story. A story that takes place in the faraway magical land of London. Oh, a brief bar, you know, I'm gonna go Greg's mate. Oh, I love it, mate. I'm catching the Cock Foster's line to fucking Coxberry. <laughs> So it follows Eden Starling, an incredibly talented soprano and owner of this opera house. She is adored by all of her fans and admirers, but not her workers who she treats horribly. They ask if they can have Christmas Day off to be with her families and to enjoy Christmas Day. But being a typical tyrannical boss, especially in the Victorian London era, she says no. Eden is so dedicated to hating Christmas, it's almost impressive. Even when her best friend comes to beg her for the day off, her best friend in the whole world, Eden says this. Take down the trees, stop the carols, and get ready to work tonight, tomorrow, and all through the week. Anyone complains, anyone goes home, anyone breathes one word about Christmas, they're out, including you. So then that night, Eden is visited by a ghost, the ghost of Christmas past, who has the most hilarious British accent. They're the chains I formed in life. Chains of selfishness. Come on, if that's not the most British sounding woman of all time. Not a ghost. I am floating two feet off the ground. How much ghostlier do you want me to be? Literally my favorite character. God, I wish British people were real. So the ghost of Christmas past takes Eden back in time to her childhood to help her discover why she hates Christmas so much. And surprise, surprise, Eden's aunt hates Christmas. Not even letting Eden have a day off from her practice. Meanwhile, next door, Eden's best friend Catherine is having a little Christmas shindig. So the two decide to perform a little Christmas song. And again, this movie is so British. Oh, those dresses are stunning. God, I love it. So the two begin to sing and, wait a second, computer. Zoom in. Enhance. That's the same fucking guy. 
Interesting. One weird thing is that Eden in her ghost form can only be seen by dogs, but the dog does notice her and it's in the past, so is there some weird butterfly effect going on where her interacting with that dog creates a ripple through the space-time continuum and when she goes back she's no longer British but is a Malibu party girl? Maybe. But I'm just here to ask questions. Hi. Snugboy for the ABC. Anyways, Aunt Marie comes back and yells at her and ruins Christmas and it's kind of sad. You can see Eden not wanting to relive what is quite clearly a traumatic memory for her. And so Eden retreats back into her Christmas hating shell and goes back to sleep. Still a Christmas hater. Until next, Eden is visited by the ghost of Christmas present. And so she holds up a metaphorical mirror to Eden, showing her how awful she truly is. And everyone's here to work. And they're happy. Look at them. See? Working through Christmas isn't such a hardship at all. Okay, British Jeff Bezos, calm down. But something that melts through even the most hardened, rotten 1% heart is orphans. On Christmas, Christmas orphans who are in danger of becoming homeless because the orphanage is going to shut down. And even Eden, in all her hatred for the best holiday of the year, even she can access the powers of an empath and sympathize with their cause. And then, still not entirely convinced, she's back to bed, ready for Christmas Day. Until! So now there's the ghost of Christmas past and the ghost of Christmas present. Well, you're never going to guess who visits Eden next. It's the ghost of Christmas future! Eden is shown the future where she is jobless, living in poverty. After firing her employees due to showing up late on Christmas, the new acts failed to captivate audiences, which leaves the theater bankrupt. Catherine is now a famous fashion designer and is all, ha ha ha, I'm British and I'm mad. She too, in a new position of power, treats her workers cruelly and hates Christmas. The rich truly do eat the rich. Sweden begs the ghost for another chance to redeem herself. She wakes up on Christmas Day, gets all the workers' presents and gives them the day off and then goes to the orphanage and promises to pay for it. And then Freddy arrives and Eden hooks him and Catherine up because they've been kind of crushing the entire movie. And wow, what an amazing film. What an amazing tale. It even makes Kelly feel better. And I just, I love Christmas. I love the Christmas spirit. I love snow and I love candy cane and I love carols and reindeers. And when you get a present from a relative you don't like, but you just have to pretend that you do for the sake of being nice and hot chocolate and snacks and the Barbie. I love Christmas. And what a beautiful original tale they've come up with for Barbie. Incorporating the best holiday ever with a gorgeous story about the best holiday ever. And do you not know what a Christmas carol is? What? So you're telling me Barbie did not come up with a Christmas carol? That is not common knowledge. Nobody knows that. What the fuck is a Muppets? Okay, this is a change. Towards the end of the 21st century's first decade, Mattel wanted to sort of change the brand slightly. And we'll get into that in more detail in a minute, but we begin to see this brand change and poke its head out in Barbie Presents Thumbelina. Wow. Like Mary Posa and A Christmas Carol, this one barely has Barbie in it. She isn't portraying Thumbelina, she's just telling the story of. And the story is this big environmentalism take on how you should look after the planet. Especially if you're greedy rich property developers from an unspecified gross looking city. Is this the future of the franchise? When fairy tales and magic was so prevalent and successful? We'll have to wait and see. But basically this one is like the Lorax for Barbie fans. And if those fans hated rich people. And here we are, the last film in what I'd like to call the fairy tale era. Wikipedia calls it the adaptations and plot test era, and most people would call it the good ones. And for a last entry in this style, they really go out with a bang. Barbie and the Three Musketeers follows the story of the Three Musketeers, with Barbie playing 17 year old French girl Corinne, who aspires to be a musketeer just like her father. And I mean, she seems pretty qualified. She's doing backflips and cartwheels and has a sword and a cool hat, so. I don't know, she can probably do it, right? Upon arriving, Corinne is immediately given a big old fuck you when she walks right into the city and declares she is going to be a musketeer. You see, in our world, there is this really awful concept called sexism, which has never really come up in any of the previous Barbie movies, which I think is a good thing. The whole point of Barbie as a brand is to show young girls that they can be or do anything, a princess or a doctor or a ballerina or a baker or a film director, anything. But in this movie, they address it for the first time and a big challenge for Barbie and the three musketeer friends she makes along the way is to prove the men and the status quo wrong and show that they are just as capable and qualified as anyone else. I'm definitely not the expert or the person with the most authority to talk about this, but I think it's handled really well. Corin runs into these other three girls and then they meet this old woman who also was a secret musketeer and there's a cool training montage and there's some romance and a high budget chandelier crashing sequence and some cool sword fights and they say the line, all for one and 
one for all. Although points have to be taken off for the electric guitar, which clashes so harshly with the fairy tale France setting. And the musketeers being there to protect the royal family. Ugh. But for the last movie in the fairy tale era, I think it's a really nice swan song of Swan Lake. From her cinematic debut in The Nutcracker all the way to now, I do think they did some really cool stuff. I'm sure it's nostalgia for a lot of us, but there is something really charming about this era. Barbie, especially when voiced by Kelly Sheridan, works so well as a beautifully confident and daring princess or fairy or a British woman. The worlds are imaginative and fun and yeah, they're kids movies, but there's a reason they have left such a warm impression upon our hearts. And so no matter what happens next, these first 16 films have been a really good time. But things get really, really weird from here. Officially on Wikipedia, we are now entering what is called the modern day plots era, but let's just shorten it to the modern day era to be more casual. Come on, we're all friends here. So with a new modern art style and a cool surfer attitude, where does Barbie and a mermaid tail leave us? <coughs> Fine. I think everyone was a bit overdramatic with the quality of the pre and post 2010 Barbie movies. This one is just as fun of a romp as some of the old ones, but just in this new style. It's got a cool tale about a cool surfer girl, Lila, who wants to be the best surfer ever, but oops, uh oh, she's actually a mermaid who was given away at birth to this old guy. Happens to the best of us. So she goes on this big adventure to the mermaid world and, okay, one of the big strategic shifts by Mattel while moving away from fairy tales was to focus more on fashion and makeup. So in a lot of these movies over the next 10 years, there are big sequences of them getting glammed up and shopping for fashion. Like, and they're fine, but once you notice them, it's kind of hard to ignore them. And it's weird too, because the mermaids get dressed up, but it's like they're mermaid fashion. And I don't know what the fashion trends of the mermaid world are. I don't even know what the trends of the modern day world are. Look at me. So apart from one too many gross shots of her feet, this one is pretty fun and a good start to the new era. Except this is the last film with Kelly Sheridan as the voice of Barbie. As Mattel wanted the brand to move in a new direction, I think they felt Kelly's voice was more suited for that image of the character and less so this new teenage modern version. I just wanna say one last time that Kelly Sheridan was incredible as Barbie and some really lucky casting by the team. She perfectly fits the characters and worlds of these movies and I'm gonna miss her performance. I actually reached out on Cameo to thank her and asked her for a little message and here is what she had to say. If Mermaid Tale didn't kick off this new era, then Barbie in a fashion fairy tale definitely does. It starts out in France with some fairy tale action before pulling a really meta move and revealing it's just Barbie filming a new one of these movies. Remember, all these movies beforehand technically are just Barbie as an actor in them. In Barbie's trailer, they even have a poster on the wall for Mermaid Tale, which is a cute little Easter egg. And so now that we've established Barbie as an actress, we would just like to let you know that she's been fired. And her boyfriend, Ken, he breaks up with her. Look at that fucking little whiplash. First, we're finally having a movie about Barbie herself. It's got this new weird kinetic animation style and her life goes to shit. What do you do? France. Bonjour. Barbie just says fuck it and moves her entire life over to Paris to hang out with a fashion designer. And that is pretty much the entire plot of the movie. There is some magic and stuff involved, but most of it is her just designing clothes. The magic of the movie is the B-plot. Ken didn't actually break up with Barbie. He was tricked into saying the words by Raquel, Barbie's arch nemesis. So he spends the entire movie catching flights and running and missing trains just to get to France to win her back. Unironically, Ken is such a good character. He is so goofy and funny, and his scenes are definitely the best part about the movie even if he does look a little like Hyrule <laughs> Warriors Link. Overall, it's a good time, and Diana Karina does a pretty good job as Barbie. I think I prefer Kelly Sheridan overall, but she does a good job. So, um, good job, it's a good movie. So this is an immediate follow-up to A Fashion Fairy Tale. We're back with Barbie and Ken and Raquel in the real world of Malibu, California. Barbie's at a film premiere and Raquel rips her dress for no reason. This is a narrative tool to show that Raquel hates Barbie. Anyways, they just be chilling until fairies show up? Like I glossed over in the last one because they were in France and I don't know, magic might be real there, but in California, in daylight, in Malibu, fairies? And then they just kidnap Ken and take him away and just, what? It's a really weird decision to mix the real world with magic. Like it's not Barbie as a magical fairy in the magical world. It's just Barbie and there are fairies. 
All right. So her and Raquel, despite the differences, have to team up to save Ken from being married to this fairy girl. And wait a second, it's that guy again. <laughs> They save the day, Raquel is redeemed, and then they all forget. Overall, again, Ken really carries this one. Also, the pink haired girl is kind of hot. Okay, so you know how I was saying people being really dramatic about the quality decline after 2010? This is one of those cases where they are just plain straight up wrong. Barbie Princess Charm School is a straight up banger. We're back to Barbie playing our character, this time Blair Willows. A lovely girl living in the poor part of town who is chosen in a lucky lottery to be shipped off to the magical and highly esteemed Princess Charm School. Which okay, firstly, where in America is this? Is this even America? Because they've all got American accents and the city looks quite American, but like, what royal family is producing this many princesses? Didn't you all have like a revolutionary war over this? Huh? So Blair rocks up to the school, chip on her shoulder at a massive disadvantage and has to learn how to be a princess. They are also all assigned their own fairy for some reason. And everyone hates Blair and constantly tells her how awful she is at this and like, yeah, isn't that the fucking point? She's the lottery girl. She's not born into this. She's just a random girl. But spoiler alert, sorry, Blair isn't actually a nobody because they find this portrait of the queen when she was Blair's age in shock and horror. She looks exactly like Blair. But this discovery is overheard by Delancey who hates Blair and is going to become the queen herself. So then the dame kicks Blair out of the school, but Blair is like, I need to find the legendary crown of Gardania, which will glow when won by the rightful heir because that is a useful thing for your crown to do apparently. And then they sneak in really Ocean's Eleven style, Barbie's Eleven, if you will. Get the crown, prove themselves right, become the heir. And also she gets with the boy and I forgot to mention it earlier, but the flirting was kind of cute. Princess Charm School is pretty good. It's got fun princess stuff, cute light romance, anti-classism commentary, and some cool plot twists. Even if they already did one of those in The Island Princess, but. I think the biggest problem with this film is that you really just do miss Kelly Sheridan's voice. I think Diana worked well as the modern Barbie, but the second it goes to this new era with princesses, you pretty quickly cover the old voice. But overall, good job. We're back and Barbie is claiming to have the perfect Christmas. She's hanging out with her sisters and they're gonna go to New York for Christmas and her sister is writing music on a plane, but <laughs> even I'll excuse that because it's Christmas. Nothing can go wrong. Everything goes wrong. Their flight is canceled and then they have to drive to catch their next flight, but then they can't and then nothing is going right. And it's all because you were trying to write music on the plane, you fucking idiot. Why would you do that? Relax, you're not gonna make Beethoven's fifth on the plane. That place does not inspire creativity. And also, newsflash, Beethoven already wrote the fifth symphony. So the entire movie is Barbie and her sisters making the best out of their situation in Minnesota. I only know two things about Minnesota. Uh, one. Minnesota! And there is a lot of snow all year round. And look, I, I don't know, call me pretentious, but I just think it's unfair for a film that promises the perfect Christmas to not have the perfect Christmas. Also, her sisters are here and Chelsea or Kelly, whatever, gets kidnapped by dogs. Ugh. Overall, Barbie a mid-Christmas. We're back for our first sequel in this new era, and for the first time, we're using numbers. And while we're on the topic of cool things, Kelly Sheridan is back! Kind of defeats my swan song farewell, but I'm just happy to have her back. The film once again follows Lila, living life as a half human, half mermaid, top tier surfer. Her mermaid mum is like, yo, you should come to this ceremony for us mermaids, it's really important to me. And then Lila is like, well, yeah, okay, but my competition means more to me. And also, I only found out I was a mermaid like two weeks ago. Imagine you were half human, half mermaid, and then you found out what Halloween was for the first time. And your human parents are like, you have to come here. And you're like, bro, I'm trying to go to the mermaid meet and greet. Like, I can't, this is, no. So Lila just decides to just go ahead with the surfing competition and whoever wins gets to go to the next stage in Australia. Yeah, on ya mate, oi oi oi, come on, come on man, come on man. It all makes so much sense. She's gonna come to Australia to surf because we have such a strong beach culture. Like maybe she's gonna go to the Gold Coast or to the beautiful Great Ocean Road or maybe St. Kilda on one of the good days. I just can't believe the Barbie movies are finally showcasing the place I live. I'm so excited. Oh no, 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 please, no!
So the rest of the film is a typical mermaid adventure with a bad guy and people being cursed or whatever, but I just can't really get over the fact that it takes place in Sydney. Although the Australian accents are so horrible, which is so fun. A magic necklace? You're bonkers. A roll, it's just good and fun. Just put it in Melbourne next time, please. Princess and the Popstar. Does that name sound familiar? Uh, but it's important to keep in mind that it's a modern retelling of the original tale, The Prince and the Pauper, and not of the previous movie. Instead of a luscious magical fairy tale land, it's set in the modern day. But we still have that question of where is this? There's American accents and American culture, but there's royalty and I just, I know it doesn't matter, but it's just driving me insane. If you've seen the OG, it's pretty much the same story. A princess and a singer wish to trade lives temporarily to seek the freedom of opportunity they don't get in their average lives. But this time it's done with pop songs, including a remix of one of the originals and a pop style. Do a plie and never fall. Don't ever stray from protocol. All through the day, there's just one way you must behave. This one is actually pretty good. It's got a good contemporary twist on a tale that a predecessor already mastered, and while not quite as good as it, the plot here is still pretty fun. The two rich girls have to learn that poor people struggle, and that is sad. For one side, it's that they can't afford concert tickets. Hmm. And for the others, it's that the droughts have caused recession and no one can work and are dying on the streets. Bummer. It's a pretty fun time. There's a cool action sequence at the end. Uncharted, eat your fucking heart out. But I do want to take a point off for the villain who kind of sucks. He's just a music producer who wants to steal this magical diamond plant to be rich. Like, man, you are not Tremendal. You are not him. You will never be him. Okay, again, everyone told me that the quality of these films did a significant nosedive as soon as you hit 2010. But then you come across a film like Barbie in the Pink Shoes and it's actually pretty good, yeah. This might be one of the best ones yet. And it's because of its incredible concept. It starts off as another ballet film and you feel the fatigue as you enter the millionth ballet sequence set in a ballet school with some scary teacher and an egotistical braggart. I forgot to mention earlier, but it actually did ballet for a couple years. So these scenes also doubled as a haunting reminder of the disappointment I always was to my teacher. And that 12 year old girls are really surprisingly scary. But the film changes up really quickly when Barbie and her friend go backstage and we are gifted the magical pink shoes which transports them into the world of the ballet Giselle. And so Barbie has to play out the plot of Giselle since all the characters think that she is Giselle, but she knows how the plot is supposed to go and has to make sure that the story goes as written. It's such a fun, cute idea. And if that was that, I still think it would be a fun movie. But then it turns out she wasn't just transported to the world of Giselle, but also the world of Swan Lake. So Barbie has to act out the story stories of these two ballets that emerge together, pretending to be both Giselle and Odette, all while making sure the stories go the way they're supposed to. It's so cute and fun and delivered really well, and I just had a very fun time. And we're back with the very last film in the Fairytopia franchise, a sequel to Mary Posa. But things are a little different. Instead of Barbie as Eleanor telling Bibble the tale of Mary Posa, this one just opens up straight on Mary Posa. And she isn't voiced by Chiara Zani anymore, but by Kelly Sheridan. Which is a shame because I really did like her portrayal of Mary Posa. That aside, however, this film is great. It's actually really good. The visuals finally allowed by the years of advancement in the technology allow this magical world to fully come to life in a way they really struggle with in those early Fairytopia films. And Mary Posa herself looks fantastic. I love the model and her outfit and her hair and everything. Visually, this might be the best looking film out of the entire canon. The plot of this one is that the butterfly fairies and the rival crystal fairies have for many years been hostile towards one another, all due to a misunderstanding that the other side is evil. And so Mary Posa is sent as a political diplomat to make good relations between the two kingdoms, which okay, I get sounds boring, but it's actually really good. There's this really lovely tale in here of two Two people from opposite families becoming friends despite the prejudices and pretenses their kingdoms have about each other. And it's kind of like Romeo and Juliet, except they're not in love. Or are they? Remember when I said this about the first Mary Posa film? Okay, maybe I'm reading into things, but it feels very gay. I might be completely misreading the situation here, but the friendship between Mary Posa and Catania often fails to feel strictly like a friendship. A lot of the time it definitely feels like two people falling in love. And I mean, why can't it be? Barbie's had relationships with a million planks of wood in the previous movies. It shouldn't be that out of the question that she can have one with a girl. And there've been lots of talks in late of Barbie being a bit of a queer icon, especially after this set of images were released in support of LGBTQ plus people. But still, it's not enough. I need to know the answers. I need to know the truth. 
So I asked the writer of the film, Elise Allen, one last question. There's been a lot of talk in recent years that Barbie's a bit of a queer icon. Was that ever something discussed behind the scenes or was it, you know, too early, quote unquote? We, yeah, there, there was, I mean, there were limits of what we could do, sadly. It's not like today where you can just own that. We tried the best we could. Like we were all on board for, yes, making her an ally, making this a world where it's, it's a non-issue. And, and then celebrate it in the best way. Yeah, we wanted to. I mean, what we can do now is so much better. I probably should have asked specifically about the relationship between Mary Posa and Catania, but it was nice to know that the conversations were being had behind the scenes. Her answer really reminded me of this excerpt from a recent podcast featuring the creator of the mid-2000s Disney Channel show, Wizards of the Waverly Place. I wished we could have played more with what was quite obvious to a lot of us was the relationship between Stevie and Alex. Right? Right. But well, we weren't been, yeah, we weren't able in that time to yet. in that time. Yeah. Well, it but it was pretty clear to all of us what that relationship was. Yeah. So if that we were just really a fun. few years down the line, we maybe could have played yeah. with that. Which At that time, be. it wasn't a thing. No, we couldn't no. Talk But we got that. as close as we could to... <laughs> I mean, it was pretty close. Yeah. It was pretty right there. It was pretty much no, right there. No, I love there. that answer. That would have been great. That would have been great. I just hope that as we become more and more progressive, more kids can grow up watching all types of people being in love with each other. And I swear to God, if I have to spend the next six months waking up to comments calling me work, I am going to explode! But speaking of Elise Allen, this was her last contribution to the Barbie franchise. She wrote 14 of these movies, sometimes three in one year. And like, yeah, they're not three hour epics, but that's still such an abundance of work. So thank you, Elise, for your contribution to our childhoods. And thank you for letting an idiot like me interview you. Um, 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 and then I, so I, I was going to ask that, like, um, um, but, um, wow. Wow. Yeah. Right. Wow. Oh, you know, and you know, and like, you know, again, like I think, um, I like idiot, you know, Ooh. yeah, but it was making me thinking a lot. Like I haven't paid for the pro version of zoom. So we've got a strict 40 minute deadline. <laughs> now there is one massive pressing issue about this movie. Bibble and the lack thereof, he's not in it at all. There's these two other flatball things, but they're not him. You're not him. You are not him. You will never be him. How dare you stand where he stood? You will never make me feel the way Bill made me feel. At least Alan's departure sort of lined up with another shift in the feel of these movies. While officially, according to Wikipedia, we're still in the modern day plots era and have yet to reach the end of home video releases and pre and post Dreamhouse Adventures era, I think the movies can be nicely split up into three distinct stages. And so I'd like to call this one the Plastic Sister era. One, because the art style changes radically into this new plasticky sort of look. And two, because from here on out, the sisters begin to play a lot more of a prominent role. And also because the Wikipedia era names are so awful, end of home video release era like yeah it's accurate but if barbie's one thing she's gorgeous and that is not it and also i'll be real this video is really 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 long so i'm gonna speed through this era not to discredit the artists behind these films but they do sort of just start to feel a bit samey it's barbie doing something as a modern princess or helping out her sisters with an animal related problem or rarely and excitingly something else happens so to the seven fans of barbie and her sisters in a ponytail out there sorry i'm not doing a massive in-depth critique so barbie and her sisters in a ponytail is exactly that barbie and her sisters go to an equestrian club and then compete in an equestrian competition to prove to the rich kids that they are better. And also Barbie falls in love with a magical horse or something. Ugh. I'll be real, I'm not really into horses. And the only time I rode one, it shat mid-walk and it made me really uncomfortable. The Pearl Princess is another mermaid film. It follows Barbie as a mermaid who's hidden away from the rest of civilization, but she sort of sneaks away to assimilate into society and also she has magical powers. There's so much worrying about fashion. This annoying botanist guy and her aunt getting fake stabbed. And also there's this starfish that kind of sounds like Matthew Lillard, but it's not. Each one of my poisonous spikes means a terrible, horrible end. So that's pretty disappointing. This one is about a princess who finds, you'll never guess, a secret door that leads to the ugliest looking area in any of these films. Oh my God, oh my God, I cannot. It looks like sugar and rainbows were poured on the screen by an unflattering three-year-old. The villain is some awful, annoying child. There are a bunch of rubbish musical numbers. The singing voice of Barbie is clearly not Kelly Sheridan. And look, 
I'm just beginning to think maybe you're not supposed to watch 42 Barbie films in a row as an adult. Like she gets a magical new dress right- He's gone off the deep end. Call in Operation Pink. And it's like, yeah, do you believe in the power of- <laughs> Do your job properly this time. No more mistakes. Can I get a glass of water, please? Knock knock, it's 2015. And if you thought the biggest superhero movie of the year was gonna be Avengers Age of the Robot Guy, then you got another thing coming. It's Barbie's foray into the superhero genre. And wow, a butterfly makes her superpower. That's amazing. I wish it would fix her friend's awful hair and the way she looks. God, this is the worst looking Barbie yet. Oh, how far we've fallen. There's some general superhero going on. She saves people. She has a secret identity. A rival hero with identical powers comes in. She saves people again. Okay, to be honest, she saves people a little bit too much. It kind of gets annoying. I don't know what to say. I saw Across the Spider-Verse the same week I watched this and that changed my life. This did not. <laughs> I am so sick of royalty. Okay, so in this one, Barbie is a princess and this girl is a rock star and they're both going on separate cruises at the same time to private academies opposite of each other where one is for music kids and the other is for princesses and yet they somehow get mixed up and have to live in the other one and it's like Princess and the Pauper kind of, again, and mixed in with Princess Charm School not doing any of it good. Like, imagine being rich and sending your kids to this music school and their music sounds this bad. Everybody's got a voice in God, that's embarrassing. Although there is a girl with a Southern accent in it and that was cool for Barbie to do something so progressive for our society. The first person from Georgia to ever be represented on screen. We're in a puppy chase, baby. Barbie and her sister lost their puppies that they had, I guess, I don't know, I just guess they adopted them at some point. They never really explain it. So they go on this big adventure through the jungle to find their puppies who we know the entire film are just chilling in a van somewhere. So there is no dramatic tension, no nothing. You get nothing. And then they have to rush to make it back in time for Chelsea, formerly Kelly's stupid dance competition. And after all the stress and turmoil, she falls over in her dance. I, I've always hated you, Kelly. <laughs> Barbie's Spy Squad opens with such an exhilarating action sequence. It's like Mission Impossible crossed with Charlie's Angels crossed with our favorite Malibu girl. And then it's just an okay sort of spy movie. It's fun and cute. There's a robot dog that sounds like John Oliver, but I don't know, I feel like we got the Barbie Spy stuff done pretty well in Prince's Charm School. So thumbs up. Okay. I gotta give credit to Barbie Starlight Adventure. It is so ambitious in its sci-fi creativeness, filling the world with new planets and future utopia cities and different species of life. It almost feels like the fifth element or Star Wars. And speaking of Star Wars, genuinely the score of this film does such an amazing job at capturing John Williams' unique music of the Star Wars films. The way the woodwinds and strings in particular feel so reminiscent of his work, it's kind of crazy. So massive shout out to the composer, Toby Chu. And the story is that in this one, Barbie has to go to another planet to get this thing for a king, but the king doesn't tell her the full scope of the plan. So she decides to do the ethical thing in the situation. And then the king hates her for it. And it's stupid. Oh, just don't pay attention to the story. Just pay attention to the music. Because if you do pay attention, you realize that this isn't Barbie portraying a character. This is just Barbie in space, in the future. I know the idea of Barbie is to show little girls that they can do anything, but girls, listen to me. You can't go to other planets. There's no oxygen out there. You can't do it. It's literally impossible. Okay, so in this film, Barbie and her sisters go and visit their grandmother in a small town from their childhood. And her grandmother just adopted some puppies who are the same puppies from the great puppy Jason. Oh fuck! Okay, so my bad, the titles of these films are super similar and I accidentally watched the second one first, but that made this film an enjoyable watch because I kept getting all the questions I had from the second film answered, like, where did the puppies come from? And 
Where did the puppies come from? This one is actually pretty fun. Barbie's just off doing her own thing, but who cares? But her sisters are doing some real Indiana Jones level investigating, trying to unlock the secret of the town. There's a great adventurous sequence at the end where they find a giant tomb full of gold. Holy shit, that is a lot of gold. Hobbit, eat your heart out. At one point in the movie, they have to watch a VHS tape and the younger girls complain they don't know what it is and like, oh my God, the first few Barbie films were on VHS. This is the first time Barbie is voiced by a new actress, Erica Lindbeck, who a lot of you probably know from Persona 5, Final Fantasy VII Remake, and about 600 different anime. She does a really good job, taking the voice in a distinctively different direction compared to Kelly, and I like it a lot. So overall, this film is a good time, but not the best time. I personally just wouldn't call it the great puppy adventure. It's a great puppy adventure, but not the definitive one. In this movie, Barbie is a gamer. Finally, it's a Barbie movie made specifically for me. <laughs> Not only is Barbie a gamer, she is a game designer. And after working on an indie 2D platformer darling, she takes a little break before being sucked into the game, Tron style. And then she has to go through a bunch of different games and recruit the NPCs to stop the evil virus that is destroying everything. It's a pretty cool idea for a Barbie movie. But what I think is more cool is that every game she goes into has its own distinct art style. You've got this Minecraft voxel looking level, this neon lit racing one, and this art style, where the frame rate is just halved. I think I know what they were going for, but ugh. But as a gamer myself, it just looks like Barbie doesn't have the horsepower to run the damn game. No, 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 wait, let me do that joke again. It looks like Barbie's running the game on the Nintendo Switch. No, 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 wait, let me do that joke one more time. It's like the game was released early because the devs were crunched and overworked. This one is fun. It's a very surface level gamer movie and not a love letter to the medium like the ballet movies are to that art form. But overall, a good time. I just think it would be really funny if Barbie released her game after years of delays and is canceled for not delivering on her Kickstarter rewards and offensive tweets from 10 years prior. You know, make it a true gamer movie. Okay, I've got a bone to pick with this one. Every single Barbie movie is available on the Australian exclusive streaming platform, Stan. Up until movie number 36. And then you have to swap over to Netflix to watch the rest, but Netflix has their new dumbass pay per device policy, which is so stupid and I'm so mad at this movie because of it. I hate Netflix and I hate that Ken is a marine biologist. He's supposed to be a himbo and I hate that Barbie tricked this girl and all she did was believe in the power of friendship. But it's pretty funny that Barbie wraps herself up in seaweed to convince the evil redhead scientist that she is a mermaid when the real mermaid breaks out the magical dolphin so they can all escape together. Look, okay, it makes sense in context. Something weird happened between this film and the last. For the first time ever, the Barbie movies didn't release for over a year. There was no Barbie film in 2018 or 2019. But then, when we needed her most, through the depths of the darkness that surrounded us in 2020, our light reached out and saved us. Barbie returned! Princess Power is, again, a princess and the pauper sort of story, where there is a princess and a regular girl, and they secretly swap places. Except in this one, the pauper is a YouTube vlogger, and being a YouTuber is so cringe. <laughs> There's vlogs and an IRL twit stream and Ken has a bad haircut and also they're not together at this point. Keep up new continuity, I guess. One interesting thing is that the princess's advisor figures out that Barbie is pretending to be the princess very quickly. And he finds out because she forgets to take off her jewelry that says Barbie on it. Barbie, you are an idiot. There are some secret twin stuff, some cringe influences, and they all learn to be themselves. Although there is this pretty funny gag where the princess as Barbie is called out by her friends and she says, uh. Right, I'm Barbie and you are my friends. I promise 37 films into this, that is a hysterical line. One weird thing about this film is that Barbie's voice is replaced again, but Erica Lindbeck is still in the film. She plays Princess Amelia, who is pretending to be Barbie, while Barbie is now played by America Young and she's good. But I'm so sick of talking about this movie. Can we just please move on? Chelsea, I hate Kelly, she's my least favorite. Also, what does that even mean? You lost your birthday? It's on the same fucking day every year. You got lost on your birthday. There is a clear difference between a lost birthday and a loss of your birthday. You Just be appreciative that you can go on a cool cruise for your birthday because of your mum's cool job. That is awesome, good for you, I hate you. 
this Barbie movie is made for me because I grew up in a small little Australian town and moved to the big city of Melbourne and had to make my way in a new place and that is what this movie is about. If you only read the title and ignore the rest of the story. In reality, it's about Barbie moving from Malibu to New York to go to a music school. I always hear about this in American media and I guess it's a big deal to move from the west coast to the east coast, but it's only a five and a half hour flight, like that's not that big of a deal, right? So when Barbie rocks up, she realizes her room has been double booked by another girl also called Barbie Roberts. And so she is a new Barbie to the roster, which is so cool for little girls of color to see themselves on the screen. But I'll be honest, I didn't realize that they were two different people. I thought with the dolls, it was just that some Barbies were white and some Barbies were black, but they're the same character. Cool. Anyways, I kind of stopped paying attention and Barbie breaks her legs. No, Barbie, you have to go to the hospital, no. Here we go. One more mermaid movie. In this one, they all turn into mermaids, including the sisters. Great. But what is cool is that Brooklyn Barbie, as she is referred to, was now a permanent inclusion to the roster, which is so cool. And it's a sequel to the previous mermaid movie where the evil redhead is desperately trying to prove that mermaids are real to no luck. And I think that is a little funny. Just a scientist so shaken by undeniable proof of what she saw just being laughed out of the room. <laughs> you deserve this, you're a redhead. Okay, I'll be real. This movie actually is kind of an epic road trip. Remember Black Mirror Bandersnatch, the interactive film where you get to choose what happens like a choose your own adventure book? Well, this is just like that, but for Barbie fans. Giving the plot a little bit of interactivity is actually really fun. Barbie has some pretty big life decisions on her hand, including whether to move to New York permanently for school or just stay in Malibu where her family is. And also if she wants to date the K-Dog. And then you're going on this massive road trip across the country and her little sister wants to start an app? Okay. What impressed me the most is that picking which scene you wanted to go to next was integrated super well. I kept expecting there to be some sort of jitter or stutter when the option was chosen, but it transitions pretty perfectly, including the background music. I am genuinely pretty impressed. I just don't personally love being given the powers of a god to be able to play with these people's lives. At a whim, I can ruin everything they've ever hoped and dreamed for. No one person should be able to have this power. Who am I to control these sending Oh, uh, never mind. They still got together. One bit that massively confused me was right at the end. The gang goes to New York, but they get stuck in a lot of traffic. The Barbies are running late to their audition show thing, and you have to choose between running across the city or catching the subway. I thought the most logical thing, of course, was to catch the public transport. It's quicker and it's more convenient and you're gonna see more rats. But when you pick that option, the subway breaks down and you fail. An announcer then says, Good rule of thumb, never take the subway if you're in a hurry. What? Is this like a New York thing? Is the subway system just really bad? I would never ever run across Melbourne rather than take the tram or train. Please, genuinely, if you're from New York, can you please tell me if this is right or not? Overall, the interactivity is really fun and makes this a really memorable Barbie film. And Ken has this really cute cow joke. You mean, move. Never change, K-Man. Well, here we are, the 42nd and final Barbie movie. March 2023, we were gifted Barbie, Skipper and the Big Babysitting Adventure. As I watch this final film full of Barbie's younger sister Skipper aiming to prove herself as a competent worker against the evil intentions of Tammy, I couldn't help but think about this entire journey. It's kind of hard to remember how we got here. From early 2000s animation, full of ballet, a magical paintbrush, two identical girls, romances, weird animals, fairies, mermaids, bibble, gossip and romance, Christmas adventure, and everything in between, I couldn't help but think that although this was more difficult to marathon than I thought, I had a fun time. These movies are pretty good for kids' movies. I went in with the assumption that they'd be really low effort, lazy cash grabs, but was pleasantly surprised by how much love and care were put into them. If I ever have kids, I'll definitely raise them with some of these, just how like me and my sister were raised by them. And I have such fun memories of watching these with my sister, so if you're watching, thanks for that. Can you transfer me $10? You haven't paid me back for the Uber yet. But you guys don't care about sweet, sweet nostalgia. You want to know, what is the definitive ranking of all 42 Barbie movies? <laughs> I'm gonna do a 
fucking mind, dude. <laughs> it might even bother me one more fucking time. Uh, for context, by this point, we'd been shooting for 12 hours. Hi, we're gonna rank every single Barbie movie. This means it's the best, and this means it's the worst. And we got 42 of these, so let's just not fuck around. We got nothing to do. Okay, number 42, Barbie and the Secret Door. This one was so fucking ugly, and the villain was shit, and also it was a child, and I hate children. <laughs> Oh no, I messed up the order already. 41, Barbie the Pearl Princess. I don't actually remember what happens. No, that's the one where she's like, she's like locked away by her auntie and the auntie's like really mean. And then she goes and there's like a, there's like a really annoying botanist guy and it's really shit. Don't watch that one. Barbie and her sisters in a ponytail. I really hate horses and I had a really annoying horse girl in primary school, which I think everyone did. And that just really ruined it for me. And then also Barbie flirted with like a horse that was extinct, which was really gross. Barbie Rock and Royals, I hate rich people. And like, just imagine being rich and sending your kids to this fucking private rich school academy and the music sounds that bad. That's so embarrassing. And also there's like a rich school and a princess school, like, like against each other. And they take like separate yachts at the same time adjacent to each other. And it's so fucking stupid. It makes me so mad. Barbie a fairy secret. I don't remember what happens in that one. I don't remember what happens in that one. I'll be so real. What the f Oh, that's the one where Ken gets kidnapped by the fairies. Okay, Ken gets kidnapped by the fairies, which is kind of fun, but it's just really boring. And then also, um, uh, they forget everything at the end, which is like kind of stupid because they actually go through a really nice like character arc and she learns so much about herself, which doesn't even fucking matter because she forgets in the end and uh, whatever. Barbie presents Thumbelina. Now I hate this because it was really ugly and scary. And also Barbie's belly in it. It was just Thumbelina with Barbie tacked on, which is a crime. That's a crime. Geneva War Convention's crime. Barbie, Chelsea and the Lost Birthday. We all know that I fucking hate Chelsea slash Kelly. And again, it's not a lost birthday. You got lost. You walked off of the cruise into a jungle and got lost and mauled by a tiger. That's not a lost birthday. You were lost from this world on your birthday. A Barbie and her sister in the puppy chase. Now this one is not that good. It's like kind of good, except not really because the whole problem is because Chelsea has to get to her like da ballet dance tap assignment thing, which again, she falls over in, which is really stupid. So everything that goes wrong in this film is because of Chelsea and also I watched in the wrong order, which is my fault, but it made the film less enjoyable. A Barbie, perfect Christmas. We all know that I love Christmas, but it was in Minnesota. There is nothing good in Minnesota. Minnesota! Also, we're doing like up and down because I just had another room. So like vertically does not mean quality. It just, it's, it's horizontally only. And speaking of next horizontal and vertical, we've got the vertical type cities of New York and big city, big dreams. I have big dreams, but I don't live in a big city. And that really ostracized me from enjoying this film. <laughs> Sorry. Barbie Princess Adventure. I don't remember this one. No, this one's awful. It has YouTubers in it. Okay, I'm replacing this. This is... This one was better. Okay, we're swapping. That one had... This one had YouTubers in it, which is really awful. Like, I have to wake up with that every day and cry in the mirror when I realize what career I chose when I was going to go to fucking law school. That's fine. That's a joke. I wasn't gonna go to law school. I stood the camera. That's a joke. I wasn't gonna go to law school. Barbie Spy Squad, she's like a spy and she's in a squad, which is pretty cool about it, who cares. Barbie and her scissors in a puppy, in the great puppy adventure. Again, it was it was an okay puppy adventure. If it was called Barbie in an okay, mediocre 90 minute Barbie adventure, puppy adventure, I would be fine with it, but it's not. <laughs> it's not the definitive puppy adventure. That goes to Underdog, okay, shout out Underdog, high five, man. Barbie Mermaid Power. Which fucking one is this? It's like 17 mermaid movies. Um, this is the one, no, this is the one where her sister, it's the sequel to the other mermaid one. And this is the one where the mermaid, uh, she, all of them turn into mermaids, which is so exciting for people who want to become mermaids because all you have to do is know Barbie and be friends with Barbie. And that's called nepotism, which I kind of wish didn't exist in the mermaid world. I thought it was a fantasy escapist land. Barbie Starlight Adventure is um, cool because it's really weird and the music's pretty good because it's like John Williams Star Wars. Um, but, what am I doing? Okay. Barbie Dolphin Magic. Wait. I thought Barbie Dolphin Magic was... No. No, sorry. That's the first one. That's the second one. Okay, yes. That's the first one with the red head. Okay, whatever. Barbie Princess Power is like the MCU Barbie movie, but um, um, Willem Jackson, Samuel L. Jackson doesn't come in at the end and say, I'm recruiting you for the King Dynasty. What's it called? <laughs> Barbie Diamond Castle, ooh, contentious. He made a controversial opinion. I'm not perfect, nobody is, except for Barbie, but not in this film. She made a mistake by releasing this one. Barbie Video Game Hero. I'm a gamer, game, game, game. I love to game, I love esports, I love competitive gaming, I love being a part of Wrecked Gaming Network. Barbie Skipper in the Big Babysitting Adventure. It was a nice little farewell. It was actually pretty good, it was a ride. She had like the gamer girl like hair streaks, which is pretty cool hairstyle. Barbie Magic of the Rainbow. Now this is the third Bibble movie. 
This one was okay, but they were just like really rude to Alina for no reason, which I thought was a bit stupid because she saved the world two times at this point. So that's, that's, that's when I have to think about that. Uh, Barbie Swan Lake. Uh, Okay, so I just think it's gassed up a little bit much. It's a little overhyped. It wasn't that good. It was pretty boring. The villain was really bad. The villain's daughter was really bad. It was really ugly. And I got sick of Tchaikovsky's beautiful score. So like, that's a, that's a, that's a bit of a crime. That's a bit of a crime. Barbie the Nightcracker, crack, 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 crack. Like, I just, it's the first one. I give it props for being the first one, but it's so fucking boring. Nothing happens. And then they just have a random ballet sequence at the end and I don't care about ballet. Barbie, Fairytopia, B-Man, shout out to you. I love the B-Dog. Bibble, so good. Saves this movie, but also kind of makes the movie. Barbie, a fashion fairy tale. Now this one is actually pretty shit, but the Ken stuff is really funny. He has to like run and he misses a train. I miss a train a lot of times. So shout out to the K-Man. <laughs> Barbie 12 Dancing Princesses. I know I was a bit mean to it earlier, but it was just a bit of comedic writing. It's actually okay. I was a bit boring, if anything. It's pretty boring, but I think I'll put it there. I, I'll defend it. I'll give you guys. See, look, you're like, you're not number last. So number last is not, you know, you're better than that. Barbie Fairytopia Mermaidia. We are running out of room, so it's going to get quite dicey. But basically, this one was good because it had Bibble in it and he did a low sexy voice and I felt something in my pants. I haven't felt for a very long time. Barbie and the Three Musketeers. She's French. That's a win, depending on who you ask. Uh, she does a backflip. I can't do a backflip. There's a hot air balloon and... Um, um, <laughs> what happens in it again? They say that one line, one for all, all for one. Barbie and a mermaid tail. I didn't put that up fucking a butt. No, that's so stupid. Sorry, let's swap that. Oh no, actually though. No, no, let's, sorry. Let me swap this around. So that's like that. <laughs> it's fucking boom, 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 boom. Mermaid tail is down here. And I'm sorry, I can't, that was a missing mermaid judgment. Mermaid tail is like, all right. It's like a little beaching, uh, beach, beach movie. Kind of like Disney Channel, Ross Lynch, teen beach movie, 2011. But like, not quite like that. Barbie, Princess Charm School. That is a bit high, you might be thinking, but also, Pretty sure I was high when I watched this one. Barbie Princess Charm School charmed me. <laughs> Barbie Princess Charm School was cool because it shows that anybody can come from anything through luck and chance and not being born into a royal family and then being adopted by some poor woman. <clears throat> Barbie epic road trip. Oh yeah, this is epic. I like clicking on things and having options and controlling the buttons that I press. Barbie Mary Poster and the Butterfly Fairy Friends. Which one's that? That's the first one. Barbie Mary Poster, the first one is actually like pretty good. It's like, she's a really cool character. She got a different voice from Kelly Sheridan's Barbie. Uh, I thought it was gay for a second, but it wasn't until the sequel, which we'll get to in a second. But actually pretty good. Like the accent's really cool because the character's really cool. The world is pretty cool. The monsters are pretty ugly. They go on a big adventure. There's an ugly bunny. So have to take points for that. But probably Mary Poster was starting to get into the good ones. We're down to the top 10. This is really serious, contentious stuff. Number 10, Mermaid Tale 2. You might be thinking, why is this above the first Mermaid Tale? Well, it's set in Australia and it's a bit of an L that it's set in Sydney, but the fake Australian accents are pretty crikey and funny and I like, yeah, that's funny. Number nine, Princess and the Pop Star. You know I think Snug Boy, Princess and the Pop Star. <laughs> Top 10 material, <laughs> scoff I say. But it's actually pretty good because it is just a remix of Princess and the Pauper. And is that a bad thing? Yes, but is it a good thing? Yes, because you're just getting a little story that you've done before and you put it in and you have a little pie. Princess and the Pop star pie. Number eight, Mary Posa and the Fairy Princess. This one is really gay and I liked the romance between the two, even though at least Alan said it wasn't gay, but I fucking, I know it when I see it, all right? I know it, all right? This is actually a pretty good story. This is visually the best looking one, I think. I think the character is really good, even though they changed the voice from Chiana over to Kelly. Um, no bibble, big problem. No bitches, big problem. <laughs> 10, 9, 8, 7. Number 7, Barbie in the pink shoes. This one is actually like genuinely really good and I feel like it's like an underrated. Oh, Twilight Princess is underrated. It's a little bit of a Twilight Princess of the Barbie. It's a little bit of a Twilight Princess of the Barbie universe. It's actually like, it's one of the newer ones. Well, newer, it's like 2010 or whatever. But it's actually a really cool concept and I would like to see this idea done in a, in a medium that isn't Barbie movies. Number 6, Barbie Magic of Pegasus. Does it have a girl who was turned into a horse by an evil old guy who wants to marry a teenager twice and then they give the Pegasus like long eyelashes that look really creepy for no reason? Yes. Is that a crime? No. And you can't excuse- <laughs> Is that a crime? No. This is a pretty good film. I really liked the magic and I like the music. And actually, no, to be fair, I'll be honest with you. I'll speak to you heart to heart. Like the magical cloud area at the end was pretty cool. <laughs> I'm losing my fucking mind, bro. Number five. 
Barbie as Rapunzel. Am I biased because I watched this one a lot as a kid and play the video game a lot? Of course I am, but the world isn't perfect, the world isn't fair. As Rapunzel knows when she spent the first 17 years of her life locked up in a castle dungeon tower with a fucking talking dragon and a British cat. Number four, The Barbie Diaries. Yes. No one likes this film except for me, but I love mid 2000s American high school teen drama and gossip and juice and California and girls and Kevin's there and then Raquel's there and then Todd's there and Barbie has a magical diary that she gets from a magical girl that just ceases to exist. That was never explained. Number three. Princess and the Pauper. I know. I know. It's a classic. It's everybody's favorite. But there might be two films that do it better. Princess and the Pauper is great though. It's got the music. It's got the fairy tale magic. It's got the princess and the pauper, which is just everything that you want in a princess and the pauper type film. It's got Martin Short as Preminger. It's got songs. It's got an introduction sequence. It's got a beginning, middle, and, and a credit sequence. What else do you want from a film? That's all I want from a film. Barbie in A Christmas Cow. Okay, I've learned now that A Christmas Cow actually was not invented by Barbie, but even still, this is just a really good film and I actually think I might watch it every year. And that's not a joke. I really liked it. It was a very hammy British Barbie. I love Christmas. Number one. Barbie is the Island Princess. Why is Barbie's the Island Princess the best Barbie movie of all time? It does everything right. It's got banger music. It looks pretty good. It's got good characters. Barbie is at her peak. It's got a good romantic love interest. It's got a love triangle that doesn't feel forced. Except for in a narrative sense because the parents want to force it on them but they don't want that. They want what is best for themselves aka believing in who you are and being true to yourself. It's got a talking ugly monkey. You know what it has? Heart. It has more heart than all these films combined. There's action, there's adventure, there's romance, there's shipwreck. And also... Her mum thinks she's dead and then she comes back and that's pretty cool. And there it is! The definitive ranking of all 42 Barbie movies. I've gone fucking insane. But I know so much more about believing myself. The power of friendship and the need to dress to impress. And speaking of... I've got a movie to catch. Well, all right. I think I'm ready to see Greta Gerwig's new Barbie film. Thank you so much for coming on this journey with me. But tell me what you thought of my list. Was it right? Was it wrong? Let me know down below. Ooh, I'm gonna move you to catch. Have yourselves a fantastic day and stay snug. See ya.